Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the Park Avenue Synagogue, Park Capella. Good evening, thank you all for coming. That's the end of our concert tonight, so if you please, we have a reception and we'd love to greet you downstairs. Thank you again so much for coming. Okay, I'm kidding. Um, welcome, my name is Colin Fowler. I'm the music director of the Park Avenue Synagogue and it is my... Okay, I didn't, I didn't plan that as an applause line, but that's great, that's really great. Um, anyway, I, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here this evening. We will be exploring uh, the music of Pharrell Williams this evening and uh, all of his different genres. We have a lot in store for you tonight. That was a joke. You could have laughed a little bit harder than that. Okay? Anyhow, we have a wonderful evening and we are so glad that we get to share it with you. And we are going to continue with a little bit more from the Park Pillows. Shalom. 
Let's give it up for the Park Avenue Park Appellas. Thank you all. Thank you all. If any of you are interested in joining the Park Appellas, please see Cantor Schwartz after the concert. Of course, you have to be a teenager, so just warning. Um, before we uh, continue with the concert, I, uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge a few people and just to make sure everyone knows um, how much goes on behind the scenes here. We have an incredible professional and lay leadership here at Park Avenue Synagogue. We all know we have great cantors, but we also have uh, an incredible professional choir, professional band. We have a great ensemble, um, and also very, very important to um, our program here is our incredible music committee. If you are on the music committee, would you please stand? Yes, give them an applause. Thank you, thank you. We have pizza upstairs for you guys, if you want it, okay? Um, anyway, as we continue the evening, I would like to uh, invite our, uh, our regular alto, Yona Garshatsor, to come and uh, introduce our special guest for the evening. So I will invite her to come forward. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, cantor Mayor Finkelstein is the senior cantor of Congregation Beth Yeshurun in Houston, Texas. He was born in Israel, the son of the late cantor Svi Finkelstein. The family emigrated to England when Svi accepted a cantorial position in London. Mayer showed outstanding musical abilities and at an early age began accompanying his father and older brother Arie at services. The boys and their father recorded two albums of original liturgical music, which were released in the USA under the Mercury label. At the tender age of 14, Mayer became the youngest cantor in Europe when he accepted a post at the synagogue in Glasgow, Scotland. At 18, Mayer became cantor at London's prestigious Golders Green Synagogue. During this time, he also attended the Royal College of Music on a scholarship, graduating with top honors in singing, piano, and composition. In 1974, Mayer emigrated to Wilmot, Illinois, when Beth Hillel Congregation discovered his musical talent and engaged him as their cantor. In 1982, Mayer became cantor of Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, California, which he served for 18 years. During this time, he also enjoyed a successful career as a Hollywood composer and arranger. <coughs> Mayer scored numerous television shows, including episodes of Dallas and Falcon Crest, as well as many TV movies of the week. He collaborated with Steven Spielberg, composing music for the Visual History Foundation's award-winning documentary, <coughs> Survivors of the Holocaust, for which he was nominated for a cable ace Award. Mayer is one of the best documented composers of contemporary Jewish music. He has composed over 150 settings for the liturgy, and Mayer's compositions are sung all over the world, his most famous settings being Le Dor Vador and Ve'al Kulam. On November 6, 2010, the American Conference of Cantors performed his Modim Ve'al Kulam compositions in Rome. Italy in front of Pope Benedict. In 1987, he composed a Jewish requiem, Nishmat Sedek, which has been performed in various cities throughout the United States. Three years later, he premiered his large-scale cantata, Liberation, at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles, California. Written to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the liberation of the Nazi death camps, it featured the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Los Angeles Master Chorale, many well-known soloists, and the entire evening's performance was hosted by none other than Billy Crystal. After the live performance, Mayer recorded a CD of liberation with the Israel Philharmonic. More recently, he performed the work of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Yoel Levy, and in 2007, 
Mayer debuted his Passover Seder rock musical, Matzah Do About Nothing. <laughs> he also composed a new cantata featuring both Jewish and gospel choirs entitled, I Won't Forget You, O Jerusalem. Over the years, his colleagues have commissioned Mayer to compose many original compositions. Additionally, he has produced and arranged numerous recordings for them. Mayer possesses a beautiful lyric tenor voice and has taught and mentored many, many young cantors. He is also an authority on the history of Jewish liturgy and he has lectured as a scholar in residence at synagogues throughout the country. Mayer believes in physical fitness and healthy eating and when not working out, he enjoys a good game of golf. He was cantor at Congregation Sha'are Tzedek in Southfield, Michigan for eight years. Mayor is married to Monica and they have two children, Noah and Emily. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Cantor Mayor Finkelstein. Shombre Shabbat Vekore on the Shabbat so much. So I have some slides that I want to share with you tonight. But before I do that, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be here and thank your wonderful Hazan Azi for inviting me. This is a very special year for me. And uh, as you can see, celebrating 50 years as a Hazan. 
And people say, you look so young. I started when I was three, that's why. They, 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 they got my bio wrong. Actually, I was three years old when I had my first cantorial position. But anyway, after such a long introduction, I, I have not much to share with you about myself because this introduction told you everything there is about me. However, as we go along, I shall show you some pictures of all the places that have affected me as both as a chazan and as a person, and the people that I've worked with, and how all these things have influenced my composition. So, throughout the years, people have come up to me and they've asked me the, the very simple question. How do you compose for the synagogue? Where do you begin? So I want to share with you tonight six criteria for setting prayers to music. And right now I'm going to share with you the first two. So as you can see, can you all see the screen? Okay, so the first one is choose a text. Okay, so if you're going to choose a text, you open up a Siddur, you, look, you can open up to any page you like. And you say, now wait a minute, has anyone ever set this to music? And if they have, is it good? Is it popular? Is there any point in me also setting it to music? That's one way to find the text. Another way to find the text is somebody commissions you to, to write a text, to, to set a text to music. And throughout my career, that's what actually has happened. It's been very rare that I sat and opened up a Siddur and I said, yes, I think I'd write music to that. Mostly, I've been very fortunate that other cantors have called on me to set a, a specific text to music. So once that happens, the, the responsibility of a composer is to understand the text. Wouldn't you agree with that? If you're going to set something to music, it helps to know what you're setting. Because if you're setting a sad prayer, you don't understand what you're saying, you can set it to a very happy melody, and that would be very unfortunate. And of course, the other way also works. So we will continue, but before we do, I want to tell you that the, one of the most enjoyable things that I have done in my career is to write music for children. Uh, you heard one of the pieces that the Parker Pellas, you call them, that they sang, that was Shalom Rav. You have some beautiful children who are going to sing another couple of things that I have written many years ago for children. One of them is Micha Mocha, and the other one is Ahavat Olam. So we'd like to share that with you now. Thank you very much.
Choir and the Park Avenue Synagogue Rock Band. Synagogue Congregational Singers. Thank you. If you want to stay young, join this group. So as uh, they are departing, they did a wonderful job. Give them a big hand. So let's continue with the criteria. Now we have criteria number three and four. So number three, determine the musical style you wish to use. This will be determined by the nature of the prayer and where it appears in the service. So what happens if um, you hired me as you canter? It comes to Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre, 
and I stand up there and I go, call me Duray, Vanessa Ray. I wouldn't last long, would I? No. That's because, as you can see, the musical style is determined by the nature of the prayer and where it appears in the service. So people ask me, would you ever reset Kol Nidre to music? I said, sure, if I wanted to commit suicide, I would do that. It's not a very good idea. Uh, now, the second thing, avoid banal melodies and strive to set the prayer using good musical taste. Oh, that's a tough one. Now, how would you describe banal melodies? Well, banal melodies probably is different things for different people. But what I try to do is try and set music to a melody that when you leave, after hearing it, you'd want to hear it again. That could be banal, I suppose, but usually it isn't. Usually a banal melody doesn't last too long. But a, me a melody that has some kind of good musical taste will last for quite a while. So uh, now I want to share with you one of the pieces that I set. This is the prayer for Israel. I'm sure you all know it. I'm sure Azi has shared it with you for many, many years. This is Avinu Shabbat Shemaim. And this one, when I read through the lyrics, Avinu Shabbat Shemaim, God in heaven, through Israel, but go low, rock of, of Israel and its savior, Barechet Medinat Israel, bless the state of Israel, Reshit Smichat Atenu, beginning of our redemption. And what came in my mind, the style that came in my mind, was something broad, like a ballad, okay? And something sweeping and something warm, not warm and cuddly, but warm. So this is Avinu Shabbat Shemaim, and if you know it, please join in the chorus with us. And the 
so much. Well, <laughs> this is a long time ago. So this is a picture of my late father, Zvi, and that's my brother, Arye, on the left-hand side. He was, he's three years older than I am. He's been a Chazan in Boston uh, for uh, over 25 years, and there I am on the right, age 10. So. I, I like to tell people that I was born on the Bima, <laughs> pretty much. This is uh, the, the cover of the first album that we made, and there's a very interesting story about this, because your rabbi, your wonderful young rabbi, uh, you know, I taught him his bar mitzvah, by the way, I, you know that, right? When I was cantor at Sinai Temple, and he was a little boy, taught him his bar mitzvah, and Elliot uh, did not have the greatest voice in the world, but he was uh, a wonderful student, and uh, I was very friendly with his father. Now, his father, Dr. Malcolm Cosgrove, and my father were colleagues in Glasgow, Scotland. Now, when I came to Sinai Temple, Malcolm invited me to his home for Shabbat, and he says, I have something for you, and he took out this long playing record with that picture on it, and on the back of it was a dedication from my father to him. So there's a wonderful connection that I have with Elliot and your congregation. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Now, a few years later, this is us, and this, this is me when I was uh, just about gonna be bar mitzvah, and we appeared on BBC television in, in Glasgow. That was uh, the beginning of our so-called fame. And there's a picture of me at my bar mitzvah. And you see my dad decided that I should be a camper already. I had a special big hat and that ridiculous looking bow tie, whatever it is. But that's how I looked. Now, after my bar mitzvah, most kids at age 13, now they're playing their video games and doing all these, these wonderful things with technology. Well, in my days, you, either, you went out to the park and you had a good time on a bike. My dad took me into the room and he said, you're going to learn how to become a Kazan. And we spent a few months together. And when I was 14, a little shul, this, this was called Pollock Shields Shul, opened up right up the street. And my dad said, I want you to go there and audition for it. I said, I'm 14 years old. He said, I want you to go and audition for it, for the high holidays. And they hired me. So I became a Hassan. Now, if you look at that, that picture, it says Muslims of Britain. And sadly, this is what's happened to this building. It's been taken over by the Muslims. I didn't want you to think that I'd converted when I was 14. Okay. Now, what do we have next, Azzy? The what? The one and only Cantor Shira Lissing. Okay. <laughs> now, Shira is going to be singing a piece that I wrote when I was in Sinai Temple. This is for the prayer of the new month, Brikat HaChodesh, and I told Shira that I haven't heard it ever sung by anybody else until she sang it at the rehearsal 
And you know, I should have written it for her because it's, she does a beautiful job. Please, big welcome to Shir.
So, after my first position at age 14, couldn't stay there too long, you know, you have to move up in the world. So at age 16, I got a job in Newcastle upon Tyne, which is north of, in north of England. It's called Jasmine Hebrew Congregation. And I went to school during the week. I actually lived above the shul and shared an apartment with somebody else. And I must have been the most unusual school child, high schooler that ever exists, because I wrote myself notes if I had to leave, because I didn't have my parents there. And one time, I was called to do a funeral. So I actually wrote a note for myself. Please excuse me, I have to go and bury someone. <laughs> Is that unbelievable? <laughs> so that's what happened when I was 16. Then I, I finished high school, and I had to, I got to a crossroads, because I was already a seasoned cantor at this point. And I decided, well, what should I do with my life? Should I continue being a cantor? My father was a cantor, my brother was a cantor. I also had a, a fondness for art, and I thought, well, maybe I should go to art college, maybe do that instead. And just when I was making that decision, uh, this job came up. Golders Green Synagogue in London. It's very famous, it's been there a long time. I was 18 at the time. And I thought to myself, okay, it's, it's gonna be music. But I'm not just gonna be a cantor. If I'm gonna go and be a cantor in Golders Green Synagogue, I'm also gonna try and get into the Royal College of Music because I wanted to get a complete musical education and that's exactly what I got. Now, what happened, this is a fascinating story. When I, I got a phone call from a certain gentleman who said, please meet me tomorrow morning right outside there at nine o'clock, I have something to tell you. Mystery, I'm there at nine o'clock a limousine pulls up a Rolls Royce. This elderly gentleman gets out. He says, uh, do you remember me? I said, no. He says, I knew you and your father and your brother when you sang together in Glasgow. And I heard that you, you become a cantor of Golders Green Synagogue and that you want to continue your musical education at the Royal College of Music. I want you to know that as a young man, I went to the Royal College of Music. And I've been coming here every day to take piano lessons and I'm gonna pay for you for everything. So, I got a free ride at the Royal College of Music. After I graduated, I came to the United States. This is another amazing story and another connection that I have with Park Avenue. Your Rabbi Emeritus, David Lincoln, was in London at the time, and I met him at somebody's home. He said, we need a cantor in Wilmette, Illinois. Are you interested? I said, I am. And I ended up, it used to be called Beth Hillel. Now you can see it says Beth Hillel B'nai Muna. They amalgamated with another congregation. So I was there for four years and worked with Rabbi Lincoln. So we know each other and we had a very good time. After Chicago came Sinai Temple, Temple of the Stars. <laughs> and it really is a Temple of the Stars. We have members like Kirk Douglas, Tell you a Kirk Douglas story. I was on the golf course one day. It was my day off, Wednesday. I get a call from Rabbi Wolfe, the rabbi there, and he says, uh, Kirk Douglas wants to have a bar mitzvah. I said, what are you talking about? He's, he's an old man. He said, no, the 70th anniversary of his bar mitzvah. And he wants you to teach him. Oh my God. So here I am, I show up in Beverly Hills at the home of Kirk Douglas. Now, when I think of Kirk Douglas, I think of Spartacus. <laughs> and I think of a young, virile actor. Well, sadly, this was after his stroke. And he opened the door, and a feeble man opens up, and he says, are you Finkelstein? I said, yeah. He said, come in, come in, and sat down. And then he says, what is this Torah portion about that you gave me? I said, it's about the priests in the temple, and they're throwing blood on, on the walls. He says, I don't want that one. <laughs> it's a true story. He said, find me another one. <laughs> so we had to change that. So a lot of wonderful ha things happened to me while I was in Sinai Temple. This is why I composed most of the things that you're familiar with, and uh, especially uh, Le Dorador. And to this day, if you ever go on to their videos of their services on Shabbat, you'll see 
whenever the cancer sings the door by door, it's a thousand people standing up and with their arms around each other swaying. Which you might like to do here at some point. Ozzy, you think they'd like to do that here? <laughs> okay. So now, let's continue with the last two of the criteria. Determine the meter of the lyrics. You know what meter means in, in, in musical sense? The beat, okay, of the, of the lyrics. And be careful to place the musical stresses on the correct syllables. We'll deal with the muse in a second. Now, how many ways are there of reading Hebrew? Actually, there's only one way, the correct way, right? However, there are two ways to pronounce a Hebrew word. Here we go. The, the first one is called milra, where the emphasis is on the final syllable, okay? So let's think of, of a milra word in Hebrew. Shalom, correct? Last, it's the last syllable, you put emphasis on the long. If you, if you didn't read it correctly, what would you say? Shalom, right? You would say, but it's wrong. You can't say shalom, it's shalom, okay? Now you have the next one, which is called milail, where the emphasis is on any other syllable, usually the middle syllable. So here's a, here's a, here's a and you all know the prayer, aleinu leshabayach, right? So that word aleinu is milail. It's not aleinu, it's a aleinu. Okay, so there's two correct ways to read Hebrew. So now, if you're a composer, and you're serious about composing, do you have the words first and then find the, the music to fit the words? Or do you have the music and try and fit the words into the music? The answer is number one. Okay? Now, sadly, that hasn't happened without Jewish composers. And a lot of Jewish composers have this melody in their heads, they open up the siddur and they say, oh yeah, this will fit. And what happens to the words? They get pronounced all over the place. And one of the worst examples of this is a tune that you're all familiar with and we sing every Friday night, Shalom Aleichem. It's composed by a wonderful Jewish composer, Goldfarb, Israel Goldfarb. But he had in his head, Fiddler on the Roof. Um -ba -ba, um -ba, um -ba -ba. Okay, watch. Here we go. Now, I've put in bold writing where the correct pronunciation should be, where the emphasis should be. So it's shalom, right? Now watch how this is all wrong. Shalom aleichem, all wrong. Malachi hashare, malachi eyom. Me, that's correct. Malachi hamlaf, wrong. Hakaf, wrong. Baruch, okay. So you can see that is absolutely wrong. And you've been singing and enjoying it for all these years. <laughs> and you've been singing all the wrong stresses. So, Finkelstein decided that he's gonna write Shalom Aleichem. But based on the correct pronunciation, so how, what did I do? I say these words and try and get a meter, try and get a beat. So watch what happens if you pronounce it correctly. Shalom Aleichem Malachei Hasharet. Mal ache el yom. Dum, da dum, bum, 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 bum. So he goes like this. Shalom alechem, malache hasharet. Mal ache el yom. Mimech, malache hamlachim, hakadosh baruch. So, after Los Angeles, I ended up in Toronto of all places, and it's very cold in Toronto, it's even colder than here, for those of you who've been there. I was there for three years. After Toronto, I went to a place just as cold, Detroit. This is a wonderful shul, Sharit setting. Look at that beautiful architecture. Everything is composed. The, ar the architect decided to make everything in triangles. And it's the only shul I've ever seen where on the high holidays, instead of opening up the back wall and you have one huge rectangle, it opened up like an origami. So all the sides opened up 
So it was like a shape of a, of a diamond. Absolutely magnificent. Beautiful architecture. After Shari Tzedek came my present shul, which is apparently the largest conservative congregation in the country, and it's called Beth Yeshurun. I'm delighted to be there. I've been there just over three years. And that is the end of my shul hopping, as they say. Now I want to tell you quickly what my influences have been as a composer. So when I was growing up, you all know who these guys are, right? I listened to the Beatles and I just fell in love with it. All of their wonderful songs and all the melodies. So you have to, you have to, you have to remember that, that all our experiences make us who we are. Okay, everything that we hear, it's all registered up here. And when you're a composer, you are influenced subconsciously by all the things that you've enjoyed in your life. Even the things that you find distasteful. Okay, they will affect how you compose. So their catchy melodies stayed with me. Very catchy. La da 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 da. Right? She loved you, yeah, yeah. Very catchy, all of it. Bert Bacharach. Wonderful. What do you get when you think? Right? Wonderful tunes. Very, very tuneful, great melodies. Now, this man changed my life completely. How many of you know about Rachmaninoff? Yes, one of the greatest composers. When I was in Israel, age 15, I went back for the first time since I was four. I went to my aunt's house in Petach Tikva, and she had an old record player. I didn't know who Rachmaninoff was at the time. I saw this, his piano concerto number two, I put it on. I thought to myself, who the heck can write music like this? These are the most beautiful melodies I've ever heard in my life. The most beautiful chords. And to this day, so many years later, when I hear some of his, his works, I, I move to tears. It's just extraordinary beauty of melody. And it's melody that lasts forever. It's melody. It's not beat. It's the tune. It's like when you go to a Broadway show, you leave humming a melody. That's what's important. Another wonderful influence is Puccini. You know, his La Boheme, Madame Butterfly, filled with the most glorious melodies you could ever imagine. Those are my influences. This is what I want to do. When I write something, I want you to enjoy it so much, it's going to stay in your head, and you'll want to sing it. Now, how did I learn to sing? I learned to sing by meeting and listening to this amazing tenor, Alfredo Kraus, who died a few years ago. And he had one of the most beautiful lyric tenor voices, and his technique was flawless, absolutely flawless. And I thought, if I can sing like that one day, and be a cantor, and be a composer, well, I would have climbed Mount Everest. And, well, I believe I have climbed, climbed Mount Everest, and I've reached the top, and it's beautiful. The view is wonderful. I want to thank you all for coming here and uh, sharing this experience with me. And I want to continue the program now. We want to invite Rachel Brooks to sing something that I wrote a few years ago. This is taken from the Slichot service, Hannah Shamalach. Please give Rachel a big hand.
Are you having a good time? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So, Cantor Finkelstein, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, you've served in so many wonderful congregations all over the country, all over the world, um, and you've written so much wonderful music. So, does it ever happen to you? It, it never happens at Park Avenue Synagogue, but does it ever happen to you that after a service, let's say you compose the new Shalom Aleichem, and you go out to the Kiddush, and congregants are coming to you and asking, well, Cantor, what's wrong with the old tune? Why do we need, why do we need to replace and change the tunes all the time? Aren't we just better off with, I, I understand they are wrong, they're wrong syllables, wrong stresses of the words. Why do we need to change the tunes all the time? Well, <laughs> Uh, oh, God, give me one that works. Okay. Hello? Is it working? So, yeah. Okay, okay, there we go. Uh, the answer to the question is I get that a lot and have over the years. I'm very sensitive to people who, who say that to me because uh, we all do not like change in, in, in all our lives, basically. We like things that we're familiar with. However, I say to these people, the melody that you like, at some point, somebody new came and composed it. Is that correct? Yes. So what happened then? Somebody came to that cantor and said, why don't you do the old melody? So at some point, we have to compose new things. Tradition is wonderful, but if we take tradition to its absurd ends, we can say, well, why don't we ride a horse and buggy today? out of a sense of tradition. Well, we don't. We're living in a different time, a different culture. Does that answer your question? It, it does, it does. Um, does. And hopefully it answers the questions of so many people who are sitting here tonight who um, <laughs> understand why I asked you and why I commissioned a new Hashki Beinu from you. Um, uh, so, so tell us about that piece that you just uh, wrote for us, the Hashki Beinu. The Hashki Beinu I wrote sort of as a, as a, a love poem. If you actually look at the, the, the translation of the beautiful prayer Hashkivenu, cause us to lie down in peace and, uh, and awaken us again unto peace. It's a beautiful, peaceful, warm prayer. And when I wrote it for you, I thought of your beautiful voice, your sweetness, and I thought this is exactly the kind of setting that will work for Hazan Azish. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me when you hear it in a few moments. This is new Hashki Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so other than Hashki that we, which we'll hear in a second, um, let me ask you a personal question. I'm about to sing something that I've never sung before. Is it fun to be a cantor? <laughs> is it fun to be a cantor? It can be. It can be a lot of fun. It can also be very challenging, as the clergy can be very challenging. It can also be extremely rewarding. I think the most rewarding part of being a, a cantor is, is the clergy part, believe it or not. If you have a chance to, to be close to a family that's in mourning, and you can help them somehow with music or with putting your arm around them, if you can go visit someone in a hospital, if you're there for, for somebody's wedding and you sing a beautiful Sheva Rafat, you bring light to people. So yes, it can be very rewarding. It can be unbelievably challenging, especially when you have congregants who keep coming up to you and saying, why don't you stick to the old tunes? <laughs> Never happened here. But, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I see so many uh, cantorial students here in the room tonight. Uh, a lot of the, the, the students that you have uh, you've taught. Give us a good advice. Give them a good advice. What, what do you think? What are the challenges that they are going to face in, in the next generation of the cantorate? And what do you suggest that they focus on? One word comes to mind, more than any other word, relevant. So if you have a congregation that wants you to sing catchy, uh, relevant tunes, that's going to make them feel good, then don't sing old-fashioned music for this congregation. Don't do it. It's a mistake. And I think it applies to anything in life. If you want to get ahead, you have to find out what your customer wants. And if your customer tells you, I don't want white socks, I only want black socks, don't sell him white socks. <laughs> so 
Sell him black socks. That's what he wants. And this is, is what's happening in the, in the conservative movement generally. It's happening in my synagogue and synagogues all around the country where we have to find a way to bring younger people into the congregation through music. And we won't do it unless we give them the music that is familiar to their ears. And that means taking the prayers and sending them something a lot more different. Interesting. You know, Kendra, um, uh, uh, and, and we're, one more question and then we're going to move on to the program. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, music critique, critiques criticized your music. They said that uh, your music is bringing foreign sounds into the life of the liturgy, into the synagogue. Uh, that uh, you're very influenced by the Beatles, by Broadway, and, and it loses the integrity of the traditional music. How do you feel about that critique? Criticism. How many of you know about klezma music? You think klezma music is Jewish? It's not. It's totally stolen. It's stolen from Hungarian and Romanian folk melodies and from Russian folk melodies. Our people have been influenced by the music of the countries where they lived for generations, for hundreds of years. There isn't really anything such as Jewish music. What we have is music that we have borrowed from other cultures and made it our own. And we have expressed our prayers by borrowing other people's music. It's not such a wonderful thing, but we're all influenced by each other. And that, that's fine, we're all influenced. I, and I see nothing wrong with that. It's okay, and if, I mean, if the Beatles have helped me to produce La Dora Dor, well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So uh, we say that cantors are paid to sing. So I'm going to uh, invite you to accompany me on this new setting of Ashkivenu, which you've never heard before.
Chairman, Eliana Light. for your beautiful music. More than 10 years ago, I visited the great synagogue, the Nohan Dohani uh, in Budapest, and um, I shared a prayer with them, Sin Shalom by Cantor Mayor Finkelstein, uh, that before the days of Hamilton and viral videos, that was my first viral video more than 10 years ago. And I remember um, uh, reaching out to Cantor Finkelstein and asking about royalties and uh, Kemper Finkelstein refuses to accept any money for any of his compositions, for any royalties, or anything like that. He just do, does it out of love of Jewish music. So thank you. Hey, hey, 
Before we sing the last song, or if you really clap really, really <laughs> hard, the one before the last song, <laughs> I want to ask you, are there any questions here for Kentra Finkelstein that you want to ask? Maxine? How do you make new music? Oh, so or maybe let me rephrase the question. How does the tune come to your mind? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's called, I, I had the last of the criteria, it's called Muse. You know, I can, I can sit at the piano for three, four hours just trying things out, and I walk away completely disgusted. <laughs> Nothing I played made any sense, and it's, I heard it before, and I copied myself, and I copied everyone else. I go to bed, I wake up in the morning, something, I don't know why, something makes me want to sit at the piano, and I compose the whole piece. So the, to tell you the truth, you have no control over these things. Um, they also say that it's 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. Well, the perspiration is getting your craft at, at a point where if you do get the muse, you'll be able to compose something worthwhile. But you have no control over that creative process. It comes when it wants to come. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, all of your Panavillian compositions, which would you say are your top two or three favorites? And then other modern composers, what would you say comes to mind as things that you think are really pretty terrific and on par with what you've done? Whoa. <laughs> so the question.
question is um, the, the, the story of, of the, the greatest hits, basically. Cheers and others. What are you most proud of your composition? Most proud of the composition. Wow, that's very hard. It's like asking um, a parent who his favorite children are. <laughs> and uh, very, very difficult to answer. Um, it would surprise you to hear that the Dorbador isn't among them. And the only reason is that I've sung it 24,000 times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> I obviously love that people enjoy hearing. But personally, I, I've written so, so much other music that I think uh, I'm, I'm more proud of musically. Uh, one of the pieces is uh, The Lord is My Shepherd. I mean, there's many things that, that you probably haven't heard. Um, the entire score of Liberation that I did with orchestra. I mean, those are the kinds of things that uh, I'm very, very proud of. As far as other composers are concerned, of the Jewish composers, um, Max Janowski, a lot of his, his melodies are wonderful. A lot of Debbie Friedman uh, melodies are wonderful. Um, Max Helfman. Um, the list goes on. I, I admire quite a few of uh, the Jewish composers. So, um, Kentra Finkelstein, I think you have inspired a lot of people here to think about tunes and compose liturgical music. I want to encourage you to go home and sit and use those criteria and write liturgical music. <laughs> Please send your draft to Kentra Finkelstein. <laughs> and if it's good, I'll use it. <laughs> but with all seriousness, I really want to encourage you to think this through and see if you can come up with something. You never know. And I want to thank you, Kentra Finkelstein, for a wonderful, wonderful gift that you gave us, all of your wonderful music, your personality, and your warmth, and for sharing your evening and time with us. Thank you very much.